I think from since morning uh, or or even uh, the, from the day of you know this infosec fusion has started, we have learned a lot about the cyber security. We have learned uh, uh, about the prevention measures. We have learned about the uh, you know uh, how to uh, detect or how to uh, respond, recover uh, everything. Like you know how to stop this uh, uh, mechanism. The both offensive and defensive side we have seen in the cyber security. But still, you know, even we learn a lot today about AI in cyber security. We learn about how to stop uh, ransomware. But nothing is perfect, right? Still, the incidents are happening. So even after learning so much, like you know this. Uh, out of say, out of 35 hours the 35 4 hours we have already spent we have learned a lot about cyber security after putting up all those techniques this still there are chances that you know you may get a ransomware you may get a malware or there's a cyber crime which is happening across so how to take uh, you know that part how to invest how to do forensic so our overall coverage will not get complete without this session so we have samir dat uh, he's founder and ceo of forensicguru.com he carries 30 plus years of experience in the industry. He has been the president of uh, Digital Investigator Investigators Association, author of uh, Learning Network Forensics, uh, Packet uh, Pack Publishers UK, and he is a, a fellow of Indian Police Foundation. So Samir is going to talk about digital forensic investigation tools and techniques. Uh, Samir, thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, stage is all yours, and happy Independence Day, happy Independence Day, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Gaurav. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to be a part of this uh, InfoSec Fest. Uh, it looks like it has been a very hectic and a very intensive one. And uh, everybody has gone through uh, a lot of in-depth training. I'm going to start by just sharing my screen. And I'm kind of hoping that it's visible. Uh, yes, it is uh, uh, visible. Excellent. Excellent. So basically, you know, uh, I'm sure, you know, because you're all from the info, InfoSec community, everybody uh, knows what digital forensics is about. Uh, I am going to be covering, you know, what it is all about. And uh, this is basically more of a primer than a very in-depth kind of a session. I wasn't aware of what the audience is going to be like, uh, but uh, definitely, you know, going forward, I would like to get into something maybe more in more detail. Maybe we could get into something like, you know, uh, WhatsApp forensics or uh, signal forensics or telegram forensics and stuff, stuff like that in more detail specifically. Uh, but this particular session is designed to give you a big overview of what is possible, what you can do, how can you do it, and what are the kind of tools and technologies that you use to do it. So a uh, broad overview, uh, feel free to, you know, uh, ask questions maybe towards the end. Uh, and uh, if it is all right, I'll use a little mix of Hindi and English. Is that all right? Maybe. Yes, that is all right. So post your presentation, I'll take the q &A. So excellent. Naya zamane ke naya karname. As we say, you know, new times breed new crimes. And uh, these are the times, you know, when we are seeing a lot of these crimes, especially in uh, the, you know, digital uh, post COVID era where people are all leveraging technology, people are all working from home, people are, you know, extensively using uh, their uh, phones. You know, a lot of people had shelved their iPads because iPads are something, you know, people use occasionally and mostly to watch movies and things. But we are beginning to see a resurgence of you know handheld devices a lot. I mean, phones are not the end of it, and uh, of course, laptops and all have always been in use. So, what has happened is that since the uh, the uh, defensive perimeter has expanded into people's houses, and uh, you know the uh, target surface has increased for all corporates and. Uh, for all uh, you know, people who are in the business of uh, information security, uh, what has happened is that the investigative surface has also increased, and we are more and more uh, you know seeing that uh, the soft targets are being targeted, and a lot of incidents are happening, which are creating uh, opportunities uh, for uh, 
let us say, uh, um, individuals, organizations, uh, uh, rogue countries, whatever, to uh, take advantage of and leverage the gaps in the defenses of uh, people uh, all over the globe. So that's where digital forensics comes in. Digital forensics is uh, uh, the technology that is used for investigating uh, data breaches uh, from your perspective uh, and also for investigating all kinds of crimes. Uh, they could be uh, digital crimes or cyber crimes as we call them or even normal crimes where you know digital forensics plays a very big role. So uh, as Gaurav uh, was kind enough to introduce me, I'm Samir Dak. I'm the founder and CEO of Forensics Guru. And we've been around since 1999. I have about 30 plus years of experience in the US, UK, and India. Okay, so what is digital forensics? Uh, everybody knows process of preservation, identification, extraction, documentation of computer evidence, which can be used in a court of law. And that is what I want to emphasize here. It is the court of law that determines whether what you've done is good enough. And you know, you will say, all right, I'm coming in from the uh, corporate perspective. I'm thinking you know, that what's gonna happen here in a corporate, it's not gonna go to a court of law. I agree and also disagree. You know, in, normally you know, in corporates, what happens is that most cases never go to a court of law, but uh, the one odd case that does can be a major pain in the backside. What you're going to see is that, uh, you know, uh, there can be a lot of very, very, uh, you know, uh, ancient history, uh, cases that involve ancient history, which may, you know, suddenly rise up like the phoenix. And you will see ki bhai, ye ab agya hai, aur koi ek ex employee hai, jo kata hai ki bhai, uh, hamari organization se mere ko wrongfully terminate kar diya. And he's talking about that seven years after the incident has happened. And then that person starts producing emails I got such a great appraisal. Look at this. I got compliments over email. This person said that you have done an excellent job and all that. And you know, seven years down the line, that data is no longer accessible. It has been archived on you know uh, LTO on uh, tapes and things like that, which are the you know the tapes exist, but the tape drives no no longer exist, and they're not able to restore it easily. And there are hajar problems like that. So what happens is that always any evidence that we collect from digital media of any sort, any shape, any size has to be done in a manner that is going to be acceptable in a court of law today, tomorrow, or sometime in the future. So even from a corporate perspective, if you are working in the incident response side, or if you have to handle incident responses, and in a lot of cases, you know, we may be from the uh, security information security side, and we are suddenly thrust into a situation where yeah, you security, you incident, you action. But this happens, and this happens pretty often. So when this happens, uh, you just have to do that. And there are some things that you always need to keep in mind, and you know, we'll talk about all that. So keep this first point in mind. It's got to be acceptable in a court of law. Whatever you do, document it. Whatever you do needs to be you know, defensible when you explain it later. So let's talk a little bit about digital evidence. Now, what is digital evidence? You know, uh, when we are uh, say threat hunting, what happens? You know, we, we examine threats from all angles. We we'll say, uh, say let's, let's take an example of a malware that has been found on our uh, system, for example. You know, when we are looking at the malware, we are, we are saying, all right, you know, let's reverse engineer this. Let's look at, you know, what it's uh, all up to. What are the things that you know it, it is trying to do? How is it exfiltrating the data? Is it you know collecting all the data and you know uh, keeping it in a certain uh, hidden location and then you know it is exfiltrating it at low traffic times and things like that? What we are trying to figure out is the behavior of the model. However, when we are doing that, what we are also looking to do is to collect evidence related to not only what the malware is doing but the malware itself. Because tomorrow we want to be able to prove that you know this particular malware has uh, affected our system. In fact, we are going to have to you know uh, report this from a corporate perspective. This is something that uh, has become a major uh, area of concern for uh, organizations, where you have to report this incident or crime to cert certain 
and when that happens uh, a lot of corporates are uh, uncomfortable about it they're worried that you know if the information leaks it can affect our organization and things like that you know there is a lot of public image and uh, you know uh, secure posture that is out there in the uh, public view which uh, gets compromised when it is you know learned that an organization has been compromised and you know the recent uh, there are so many you know ransomware cases that we've heard about read about seen where you know uh, the organization's image takes a beating because it has been hit by ransomware god forbid anybody is hit by ransomware but this is something that uh, really affects an organization uh, not just in terms of data loss but for other things as well and then there are other angles also you know so the aspects are like you know you have to pay those guys do you pay you don't pay if you pay how do you pay is there an escrow service you should use how do you go about it do you report that you paid or you not paid how do you handle it there's so many angles so you know there is digital evidence that has to be documented for every aspect because tomorrow things may uh, hit uh, you know the uh, the news for example so you you got to have uh, things to back up whatever you're going to say tomorrow so there is a lot of aspects that have to be considered so digital evidence is crucial so what is digital evidence digital evidence is information stored or transmitted in binary form that may be relied on in court right it can be found on a hard drive a mobile phone a network some a plethora of places you know so it is basically defined as information and data of value to an investigation as i mentioned i gave you this ransomware example that is stored on received or transmitted by an electronic device in fact all of us are on the in the electronic device business today on the electronic network business today on the electronic information business today so this evidence that is there it can be acquired when electronic devices are seized or secured for an examination you know it's easy to say seized and when we talk about digital evidence everybody thinks of seizure only but uh, let me tell you uh, seizure of digital evidence is something that uh, does happen and in you know especially in economic crimes and you know law enforcement related thing but in the corporate scenario your seizure is rare uh i'll give you a very interesting example you know many years ago uh, there was this situation when one of the uh, telecom service providers you know was hosting a particular app which said that <coughs> uh, you know how to determine the sex of your child unborn child now determining the sex of your unborn child is uh, illegal right but uh, that app was basically more of fun you know if you are in this position or that or some stuff like that you know somebody had uploaded content now what happened was that a whole team uh, you know flew uh, to mumbai and you know landed up at a particular tsp's uh, data center and they took us along you know because we we help a lot of law enforcement in a lot of cases all over and they said you know uh, we want you to you know image a few drives and you know bring the data back so we said fine and we were a little surprised on that account but why are they taking us just for a few drives because normally when they call us it's always something complicated you know? uh, simple things we are never called for so uh, but they said no no nothing you know take a couple of terabytes that should be more than enough it's a small thing you know we said fine we landed up there and uh, we said you know uh, so we landed up uh, and the people were very cooperative and they said uh, what do you need that we want to seize the server that contains this so the guy said you and which army you know <laughs> because uh they thought we were kidding because you know it was in a data center it was huge and the data was distributed and you know they, they said where are your trucks how are you going to carry all this back and that is when the truth of the matter hit us you know we became aware of what the actual problem was because we were not informed why they were you know going there because they wanted to you know keep it a secret right till that point and then once we got there we realized that you know it's not physically feasible to suddenly you know see all this so a lot of digital evidence is very specific today is that good old days of you know imaging whole uh, hard drives or you know all servers and everything possible on that is on the wane or on the decline because of the complexity involved just a small example so uh, again uh, what is digital uh, uh, evidence associated with electronic crimes or uh, you know and today uh, child pornography is a big problem csam which is uh, child sexual abuse material uh, is being found on telegram groups on computers on uh, uh, 
uh, different devices on networks on uh, you know uh, cloud stores and things like that all over and it has become an area of great concern in india you know this was something which we had not heard of which was not so widespread but has now become more and more more and more uh, uh, visible or is coming to the fore and a lot of action is being taken by uh, law enforcement and government all over against it so uh, again uh, digital evidence is extremely important in such cases in fact uh, i think uh, that uh, there is a particular aspect of law which needs to be i don't recall what it is which requires that anybody coming across child uh, uh, sexual abuse material on a, any computer that they are investigating for some other purpose for any other purpose if they come across it they are required to report that to law enforcement and that and if you do not report it then you are legally liable so these are you know certain aspects that most people are not aware of and it becomes a a matter of concern so this is actually more relevant to uh, practitioners of cyber security because you are the people who are you know uh, going through uh, data that is traveling over networks data that is addressed on computers and what have you so um, what are the sources just about everything i'm sure you know I, when i teach these classes in the cbi academy and i ask if there's a class of you know 35 people uh, we come up with you know about two per person easily you know so there are so many different sources of digital evidence so there's absolutely no shortage and today uh, a lot of the data with office 365 google drive and stuff uh, which is which are you know all at the end points uh, it has migrated to the cloud and when the data migrates to the cloud what happens is that uh, uh, we feel that we have control of the data but then again we may not and then you know uh, uh, there have been so many cases where uh, we have found situations where uh, uh, data that is stored on the cloud is uh, has been uh, leaked you found so many times you know that people's i clouds have been hacked where uh, a lot of compromised uh, compromising uh, photographs have been found of these actors and actresses which have been uploaded into their i cloud uh, because their uh, phones are synced and things like that and uh, you know a lot of uh, digital evidence is out there i mean uh, let me give you a simple example you know in a lot of cases we are all in you know, a struggling really hard to recover data of a mobile phone that has uh, what should i say um, a whatsapp uh, that has been deleted and we feel that whatsapp is a very important part of our investigation and uh, we are not able to get it because of you know uh, myriad reasons so what do we do uh, we actually because that phone is synced with say uh, gmail we can get it from the secret store you know uh, uh, i mean every uh, uh, gmail uh, syncs up uh, with the whatsapp you know, it's backed up there so if that uh, is set to back up we have this advantage of being able to get it from there so digital evidence can exist anywhere and in multiple places uh, on a physical media as well as on the cloud uh sorry just give me a minute i need to switch my screen uh, there seems to be a problem one of the screens is not working just a second please
I couldn't see what I was showing you. Um, is it uh, visible now? Are you able to see my screen? Uh, I'm able to see the source of digital evidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's the one. Right. Yeah. One second. Yeah. Right. Okay, so let's take a quick, uh, you know, look at the different examples of digital evidence that exist out there. Uh, today, you know, in uh, various um, the inter-company disputes, you know, uh, which go into, say, a legal uh, resolution, uh, there is the concept of e-discovery that kicks in and you are put, uh, there is the concept of what is called, you know, data holes and uh, things like that. So what happens is that an organization through legal sources will send a legal notice to the opposing organization against whom they have a case where they will say that, you know, we uh, want you to put a, you know, a data preservation order and preserve the contents of X, Y, Z or whatever. Uh, and uh, you will see that, uh, <coughs> that, uh, you know, uh, you're supposed to prevent the data from spoilation until it can be examined. So, you know, there, there is that, that is the first initial step. And a lot of that involves emails. Now, emails, you know, are uh, today, a lot of the emails are not even stored locally. I mean, in the good old days where we used to have, you know, exchange servers and other servers with email on it, uh, uh, you know, the good old uh, Lotus notes and things like that. Uh, what happened was that they were some big physical servers which were uh, either uh, co-located or located on the premises of uh, the uh, owner of the data. But today, um, a lot of this data is uh, preserved or stored on the cloud and is sort of uh, spread over multiple locations. And, uh, you know, you are thinking that is present in, say, one particular data center is perhaps a fallacy. And then depending on the different backup policies and the retention policies that are in place of the service provider, uh, uh, you know, preservation order may not work the way it is, you know, designed to work. So a lot of things have to come into uh, play in such situations where corporates need to start thinking that, look, our data is not in our possession. So in the event that we get this kind of an order, what is the kind of action we need to take? to be able to comply with the legal requirements that are out there. So that is just one, one step from a defensive perspective. There are a lot of other aspects also that need to be looked at from that perspective. So emails is a very good example. Uh, digital photographs, yes. Uh, today, you know, uh, computer forensics come into play in situations of, uh, uh, you know, uh, even HR departments uh, require computer forensic services. Uh, you have a situation where there is, you know, a sexual harassment case and uh, in uh, under the posh uh, laws or posh act, uh, what happens is that uh, you have to preserve the data, you know, which is evidence related to the cases of sexual harassment. And that is where computer forensics or digital forensics comes into play. So there are digital photographs, there are ATM transaction laws, uh, logs in cases of uh, financial fraud and uh, other, uh, you know, tax evasion and things related to that, uh, anti-corruption, for example. Uh, then there are, you know, uh, word processing documents, the metadata of the word processing documents. In fact, uh, uh, if you remember, the one of the early uh, digital forensic cases was related to the BTK killer. Uh, this is a US case and the BTK killer, the full form of BTK was uh, bind, uh, sorry, uh, bound, bind, torture, and kill. So this person, what he would do is he would, you know, catch his victims. He would bind them up, and then, uh, you know, after tying them up, he would torture them, you know, uh, and then ultimately kill them. So he was a serial killer, and uh, that person was, you know, sending out taunting emails to uh, the uh, law enforcement. Uh, now. Uh, these emails were traced by their IP addresses to a particular church in a particular location. And that uh, in the church, there was a common computer that the people who were there used. Uh, 
Now, uh, the whole thing was that uh, it was difficult to identify who used it because a lot of people used to use that computer because it is a common computer and in those days, you know, individual computers were not so common. So uh, when this was uh, analyzed, you know, the metadata of the uh, particular file, I'm sure you're all aware of what the metadata of a file is. I mean, when you do a right click, you look at properties, you can see a lot of information. Even if you open a, say, a document file, for example, and you go to file and you look at uh, properties, you'll find a lot of information. So that is metadata. So within, I mean, and that is metadata, that is your visible metadata. There's additional metadata also, which is inside the file. You know, you can find it in the header and in certain parts of the file. So when we analyze it forensically, we get a lot of metadata related to the word processing documents. And in that particular BTK case, uh, we found that uh, uh, this particular uh, person's name was in that document. And that uh, was what helped catch this person, the criminal. So there are uh, instant message histories and uh, I have a very interesting story of how I came into the uh, digital forensics industry. You know, we were from the data recovery industry initially, and we were recovering uh, data and, you know, uh, deleted data, damaged hard drive data, I think that. I've been working in Hex a long time. But at that particular instant, you know, what happened was that uh, one person came to us and said, look, uh, uh, some, uh, my wife has been using this computer for sending messages to somebody outside and I'm not very computer literate, but she seems to be, you know, doing some kind of typing, chatting and things like that. And I want to know about it. So, uh, it was a very long and complicated story, a little tragic as well. And, uh, but it gave us, uh, uh, an insight into, you know, that, uh, there is a lot more beyond data recovery that is happening in data, because this is, this is the kind of thing that you no know, data recovery company does per se. So it was like that. And this was long, long ago in 1990 or something yeah so again you know uh, there are uh, files saved from accounting programs spreadsheets internet browser histories databases contents of computer memory etc what is the objective to recover analyze preserve computer and related materials in such a manner that it helps investigation agencies to present them as evidence in court of law i've already said that but beyond that we also look at what is the motive why was this done? We are trying to figure out, you know, all the W's and the H, you know, the, the why, what, where, when, and how. This is what's trying, being trying to figure out. See, the key thing about digital forensics is it is a very laborious science. It requires you to, you know, I mean, if you, beyond the point and click forensics part, where there are, you have all these standard tools where you can just run it and, you know, and play like babies with this and I press this button, this will happen, press this button, that will happen. Beyond point and click forensics, if you actually get into the depth of forensics, there is, uh, it is a very painstaking, very laborious, uh, uh, you know, uh, this thing. And you have to figure out what each little bit does and what happens if you change this and what is the corresponding result. So uh, it is, uh, you know, like reverse engineering, um, a particular uh, piece of malware, but on a much larger scale, you are reverse engineering the whole hard drive and you're reverse engineering, uh, I mean, the whole media and you're reverse engineering all the activities that happen on it. A lot of this you can automate, but a lot of these you can't. So, you know, uh, it depends on how deep and how much time you want to go. Most, I mean, if you want to look at it from a commercial perspective, 99.99% of your customers don't understand this. They're all happy with the point and click portion, which covers most of their work. So they feel that it's straightforward, easy. Why am I not getting this particular result? Well, uh, there are reasons, you know. Uh, anyway, so we need to design the procedures at a suspected crime scene, which helps to ensure that the digital evidence obtained is not corrupted. Data acquisition and duplication has to be done. And this is another, you know, very crucial thing. Like what happens is that we, uh, a lot of people, I mean, all of you, those of you who work for consulting organizations, you get paid by the hour. So then, you know, your objective is to take the maximum time. I mean, pardon the expression, but this is a commercial reality. Uh, take the maximum time to do the job because that's how you're getting paid. This is that dihari system, you know, the more diharis you get, the more uh, money you make. So, uh, whereas, you know, th the other kind of consulting is where you're, you know, uh, based on the result, the outcome, 
and in that kind of situation for you time is of essence so you know different kind of factors come into play and these influence what are the kind of tools that you use so if you are okay with you know slow acquisition you will take a right blocker and do it if you want you know high speed acquisition you will use the logic cube falcon neo which is a blazing fast duplicator and you will then do it and things like that you know so what happens is that you have to uh figure out and understand your objectives when you are you know carrying out an investigation and from that perspective you will uh, you know define or uh, figure out what you want to use similarly uh if it is you know a life at risk situation i'll give you an example you know a child was kidnapped now what happens when a child is kidnapped a child is kidnapped and you are uh, the first thing that happens is that the you know law enforcement or the parents or whoever are waiting for a ransom call now if a ransom call is received and a ransom is paid quickly uh, there is a bigger chance of recovering the child uh, if it is done within the first 48 hours if the child is not recovered within the first 48 hours there is you know that law of diminishing probability where the longer the time the child is away from uh, or in the custody of the kidnapper the lesser the chance of survival so you need to you know identify the potential impact you need to you know figure out all right you know this is now a life at risk situation we need to pull out all stops and this particular evidence is what we got to get we got to figure out you know where the child is in this shortest possible time to be able to recover the child alive so there are so many factors similarly you know uh, you need to at the end of it produce a forensic report which gives the complete report on the investigation process and of course you need to preserve the evidence by following the chain of custody a quick overview of the steps there is identification identify the purpose identify the resources then there is preservation where data is isolated secured and preserved then there is documentation you document the crime scene take photographs sketch crime scene mapping and things like that there are some very interesting situations we have seen you know where you even uh, need to document not just the crime scene you need to document the bias you need to actually document the version of the bias the, you know the rtc the clock of the system and things like that these are small things and how do you document it you know how do you correlate that this particular uh, computer is showing the correct time uh, why is the clock working properly maybe the battery you know is not working properly and the rtc is uh, the real time clock is not functioning correctly how do you prove it later in a court of law you know so normally what we used to do was we would take uh, uh, a that day's newspaper and take a picture of the bias with the newspaper on the side so that that documents that this is the date and the time in this so these are small things very small things but your complete case can hinge on this extreme minor point tomorrow <coughs> if you are accusing somebody and that person is likely to lose his a uh, job or his liberty or his money on the basis of your accusations you need to damn well be able to back up what you're saying right so these are certain important aspects where in normal you know uh, cyber security kind of investigations we never look at these aspects but this is something that we have to you know also add on as a additional uh, aspect or burden call it what you may of this particular uh, area and then of course there's the analysis of the whole thing uh you need to process it interpret it and present it you know it's extremely easy to obfuscate data today you know suppose you know i have a file on my desktop and the uh, file is uh, uh called uh, say mysecrets.xls and you know you are an investigator you're walking past you see that file you say hell man this looks interesting and you simply you know double click it and you click it and you can see everything i say yeah anybody walking past will be able to do this what should i do so what will i do i will take that file and i will put a password on it mm. now but you're still you know you are a smart investigator what will you do now what will you do you will you know copy it on a pen drive and you will you know use your different password cracking tools or you got this hardware accelerator you will use that you will throw all the gpu power at it you will you know use distributed computing Well, you got a lot of technology available. You will use quantum computing and you will crack it. So I say, yeah, why don't I make it simple? Let me just rename the file. Let me call it uh, my secrets. dot xls. Can be renamed to windows. dot dll and copy it into some Windows system folder or someplace. Windows system config folder, for example. Now, out of 
you know every uh, uh, OS has got lakhs of files. So which files are you going to go right clicking and open with Excel and things like that? So you know that kind of analysis is something that tools are very good at. They will do it in seconds, and you just put it in, and it will uh, look do a signature analysis and identify the file. But all this needs to be done. So the data needs to be processed, and the data results need to be interpreted because data will show you. Okay, you know this is the metadata related to this file, but for you, does this make sense? And how does it make sense in relation to the case? So this is where you know the human aspects comes in. Uh, then of course you know uh, this presentation again because we want to take it to court, so that needs to be done. Okay, so I've covered all this. Uh, there are all types of crimes. We are all aware of them. Uh, you know, subka number aayega. Jamtara is making you know cyber crime uh, a byword today. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, you talk to anybody on the street and they know what cyber crime is. Uh, where it has come a long way. I remember, you know, in the early uh, or in the uh, uh, early 2000s, we would go to somebody and we'd say, "Sir, uh, we are in the forensic space." And they would say, "Forensic." So I, we would say, "Nee, nee, sir, forensic, nee, uh, forensic, nee, forensic." And then somebody would say, "Oh, arsenic," and we would say, "Nee, nee, sir, arsenic, nee, forensic." And the you know more knowledgeable of the people, they would say, uh, "Dead body, ka hai ji." You know, they've heard about it, but in a different context. So digital forensics was something that was really unheard of. I remember, you know, we were talking with one of the law enforcement officers, and they said, "What can you do?" And I said, "We can, you know, assist in cracking passwords. Said, we have our own password breaker." He said, "Really?" He, you know, pointed to this big danda lying at the in his room, you know, and he said, "This is the stick, this bamboo stick. We use this against criminals, and we get a password quickly." <laughs> What will your password breaker do? <laughs> so you know, things have changed a lot since then. Technology has progressed. And uh, uh, people's mindsets have also progressed, and there is less of uh, those kind of password breakers and more of our kind of crackers. So you know that kind of thing is there. Different types of classifications exist, you know, uh, of uh, uh, email forensics, mobile forensics, malware forensics, uh, cloud forensics. You name it, you know, it's out there. There are loads of digital forensic tools. and uh, in fact there are number of these that you know any in fact any cyber uh, security uh, practitioner should also have a number of the tools in their kit uh, i know you know that the tendency is to only have you know free tools or things like that as long as you are an individual that's fine but if you are working for a corporate it makes sense to get your hands on some good tools uh, especially when uh, you are in a situation where it may end up in a court of law so then there are you know uh, different kinds of tools a lot of them are applicable in uh, law enforcement uh, environment only and there are some which are applicable in uh, all environments so there is a field forensic kit i mean you take it to the scene of uh, the incident and uh, you can you know physically respond you get your hands on a few mobile phones you can quickly look at the contents you can grab data out of uh, hard drives pen drives cd drives dvds what have you you can collect the data and bring it back if you like there are cell site analyzers there are cdr tdr ipdr uh, ipdr is basically log analysis but it is a little bit different in the sense that because it is being used by law enforcement today and they are very uh, simple users so there is a lot of automation today built in into the ipdr uh, analysis tools where it will help you you know based on the ports and the ip addresses to identify uh you know what service is being used and in what location was the person when that service was being used so if somebody is using say whatsapp for calling uh, that can be identified that this person was using whatsapp calling and this person was using whatsapp calling while in this particular location that's an example so similarly you know you need write blockers because you want to ensure that the data is preserved and not modified in any way uh, and i'll give you some very interesting examples related to uh, not usage of write blockers uh in fact uh how much time do i have uh how much time do i have left uh sorry uh hi uh we are almost uh, running short of time maybe 5 to 7 minutes all right yeah. perfect thanks yeah. okay so um you know uh things like that so you will have tools that prevent uh, you know data from being overwritten or modified in, in any way you have forensic workstations mobile data forensic tools this forensics gps forensics 
social media analysis. There's a lot of data on social media today. Uh, password recovery. Today, you know, we also find a lot of situations where you need to collaborate uh, digital evidence with physical evidence because a lot of data is traveling on networks and people are accessing those networks from certain endpoints and you have access control to those uh, to those uh, endpoints and you also have cctv areas uh, cctv is covering those areas where there are these incidents happen you have to actually analyze the cctv data the access control data the uh, endpoint actual physical uh, data the logs on your networks and correlate everything get that all together to get the real story of what happened who is it how did it happen you know everything is not done remotely there's a lot of insider stuff that's going on in fact uh, as we, we, a lot of us are outwardly focused, but there's a pretty big problem inside as well, which we are sort of either ignoring or unaware of. So these are things that need to be looked at. And uh, again, uh, data that resides on things like uh, DVRs, for example, uh, can be uh, retrieved. Now, normally DVRs have a 15 day or a 30 day cycle, depending on the, uh, you know, hard drives that are inside. And we have all been taught right from our, uh, you know, cyber childhood, that data that is overwritten cannot be recovered. This is absolutely correct when it comes to normal digital data, but when it comes to DVR or video data, these so-called overwritten videos, there is data that can still be recovered because uh, digital videos are actually saved in a frame by frame format. And there is the concept of, uh, you know, not repeating the same frames and just recording that the same frame existed for the last, you know, 20 seconds or 30 minutes or whatever, because, you know, uh, there's nothing happening. So the, that is there. So the data which was existing below that can be recovered and the frames can be reconstructed and you can actually get uh, overwritten video, which is, you know, an incredible breakthrough uh, because earlier, you know, we were all brought up on, on this fact that data that is overwritten cannot be recovered. So that is something. Uh, then there are image and video forensics. Uh, again, uh, you know, number plates cannot be read, but with AI, and I, I, I really don't have time, but we can show you. It is amazing the amount of data you can probabilistically determine that, okay, this particular number plates, these, you know, four digits are uh, one, three, and uh, six, and uh, eight. And the probability of the six is actually only 43, but the others' probabilities are over in the high 80s. So you can actually, you know, get a list of say nine possible numbers and identify the vehicle. So technology is really progressing. Uh, there is of course image authentication with deep fakes and things out there. You know, a lot of concern is that is this a genuine uh, image or not, and this can be utilized to identify all that. Uh, so uh, just to add uh, one thing, I am getting so many messages. People want to hear more about it, and they are asking or requesting me to extend your time. So in case, uh, if you have more coverage or anything, I am okay to uh, extend it till 45. Uh, so you can have 15 more minutes in case if you have more. All right. Thank you. Sure. Thank you guys for your support. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, you know, what happens when, as a first responder, I am a, a DFIR specialist. My, my role is to say, uh, hit the uh, incident scene. I have been asked uh, or I have been tasked with uh, the job of uh, collecting all the evidence that is out there before it gets accidentally overwritten or whatever happens, you know, I need to prevent any uh, data loss so that tomorrow when I incident, uh, when I investigate the incident, my data is available to me to be able to uh, analyze and, you know, figure out what happened. Now, if I want to, you know, look at all that, uh, I need to have the right kind of uh, tools and uh, technologies to be able to get it. So then there is this, what we call the desk, the digital evidence seizure kit, portable kit, carry it to the scene of the uh, incident, uh, grab your data, photographically document it also. You know, we had this case when there was this uh, Air Force officer who had accidentally, you know, uh, died in a, a air crash. Now his uh, family was very, uh, uh, you know, uh, keen, they wanted to get into his computer and they could not get into his computer. So, uh, you know, password cracking is a very complicated process. Everybody thinks when people think of password cracking, they think it's all brute force, but it's not just brute force. You know, there's a lot of uh, science also that can go into uh, cracking passwords and things like that. And uh, I mean, uh, you can, you know, 
build biographical dictionaries you can you know build uh, dictionaries around interest and you know there are a lot of standard dictionaries also out there but uh, you need to have india specific dictionaries and things like that so there are a lot of aspects so when we arrive at the incident scene or you know in this particular case where the computer work uh, you know I, all the standard passwords are not working normally you know a person's password consists of you know parts of the name or initials or addresses or mobile numbers or uh, things like you know the date of births and anniversaries and kids kids names and you know date of births and of the kids and things like that and a combination of all those maybe interspersed with the uh, a with a replaced with an at and you know uh, uh, you know uh, e with a 3 and that kind of stuff as you are all aware so i mean you can easily crack those passwords but uh, this particular person's password was not cracking so uh, on the uh, you know incident scene uh, what happened was that one landed up with the uh, uh, you know uh, camera and things like that and took a number of photographs of the uh, you know location now uh, one one does that uh, we found that you know uh, this person was extremely fond of uh, the sukhoi clan for some reason uh, and you know uh, there were certain aspects related to that so we built a dictionary around the sukhoi and we managed to crack up on the particular uh, uh, computer so th that's just a small example but uh, one needs to uh, have something ready and available uh, what we call you know a desk or a jump kit and when you take the desk to the uh, incident uh, location you need to be able to grab uh, all the data before it gets uh, you know damaged compromised what normally happens friends family everybody tries to you know get into computers or uh, especially when if it is a, a, a you know an adversarial situation where you have a corporate employee who say uh, either leaving the organization or is actually responsible for data theft there are going to be numerous attempts to you know destroy the data that exists which may be increment incriminating for that person so what happens is that we have to act and we have to act fast and we have to have proper set process go in do what needs to be done and go out after that you are safe right so you also need to be able to document everything you need to be able to have a chain of custody and you need to do it fast cameras right blockers disk duplicators all sorts of stuff you know ability to get into max you 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 know if you have to image a mac you don't i want to open it out it's going to kill you and but uh, you need to be able to create a nice uh, uh, mac uh, image even if it has an m2 chip if there's encryption and things like that there are a lot of factors so you need to be prepared for that you need to have you know if you want to you know take it to court you need to have a proper property seizure memo you need to uh, you know uh, have witnesses uh, and things like that you need to sort of plan the whole exercise itself. now you know this is something that may not be relevant from a, a corporate perspective but uh, this is you know this can help identify uh, illegal bts or web uh, you know the uh, illegal uh, towers that are out there which may be being used for interception and things like that i have seen examples i have actually sat with one israeli you know he walked into a hotel room he opened his suitcase spread out his stuff and he began to intercept stuff on off the air you know uh, so it is like something that can uh, very uh, uh, this kind of a device can actually detect the existence of uh, uh, you know these fake bts that are out there or the uh, things like that and also it can help identify what are the actual towers that exist in a particular area so that it can be used for identifying crimes call data analysis ipdr stuff like that uh, analysis uh, gateway cdrs okay what is this Okay, so this may not be very uh, relevant to you guys, so I will. I will just skip through this, and uh, basically, it helps in identifying people's uh, lab, what we call lab, you know, locations, associations, and behavior. So it's stuff like you know, presence at a particular incident scene, places a person usually visits, places common with other criminals. In fact, in within the corporate environment, telephone call analytics is used. Uh, for you know say corporate phones to identify you know when there are situations of corporate espionage uh, it's hardly done in india but we've seen it uh, in the us we have some clients and things like that so that's it now uh, there are multiple sources of data uh, that can be analyzed you know 
of mobile phone extractions, uh, call logs, and things like that. I won't get into this in more detail, uh, but uh, you can, you know, geofence, you can figure out who, what, when, where, et cetera, everything. And then you can do social network analytics uh, related to a suspect. You can figure out who is the influencer, who is a decision maker, who is the boss, who reports to whom, and things like that. You know? In fact, uh, this was very effectively done in, in Nigeria in a case against Boko Haram and uh, a lot of success. Uh, in fact, the uh, Nigerian Air Force carried out airstrikes against the Boko Haram headquarters based on this. So, uh, white blockers, there are, uh, you know, Hajar right blockers out there. Uh, they can, they, you can have individual right blockers, which can be used for individual interfaces. And then there are all in one right blockers, depending on your budget, you know, because individual right blockers, if you, uh, are, uh, if you want to buy a single right blocker, it makes sense to buy uh, just uh, one, um, one, you know, specific to your interface. But uh, if you need to buy more than one, then it makes more sense to buy an all in one right blocker. So uh, Logicube makes the all-in-one, Tableau makes the uh, you know, individual ones. This is an essential tool. Uh, you needed to preview data. You needed to be able to see uh, what is uh, actually uh, content without changing it so that tomorrow you're not accused of actually tampering with the content or you're not accused of you know, inserting the content to incriminate somebody, for example. So uh, those are some of the things that you need to look at. Uh, there are disk images. Uh, again, uh, this is a very high speed disk manager. I will not show you the video, though it's very interesting, but uh, we'll go on. Another one, we'll leave that. Uh, there are, uh, you know, I'm, the, the key thing about this particular imager is that this is the world's fastest imager today. Uh, we have personally, I have personally seen, you know, cloning of PCIe to PCIe uh, hard drive at over 93 gigabyte per minute. So uh, that is amazing speed, especially when you're pressed, hard pressed for time, especially when you're in a situation where you have a e-discovery kind of a situation and you've got to actually look at, say, very large distinct media. You may be on the defense side and then you may have certain issues that you want to look at or preserve. And these are some things that you will definitely look at. So this is something that you need to uh, plan for. Then uh, uh, forensic workstations, these are mega mammoth machines with you know uh, uh, 20 gigs of the 20 terabytes of uh, you know uh, red uh, data all in a simple tower with right blocked interfaces with right block card readers and things like that you know uh, things like uh, phone forensics uh, there are certain devices or there are certain things which can be used for triage the normal process suppose you have an iphone an iphone is like a computer today the storage can be you know 512 uh, gigabyte so you just it's and if you're acquiring a hard drive, it can take some time. Acquiring a phone takes a hell of a lot more time. So there are times when you've got to you know go there and do triage. You need to be able to you know quickly see uh, a person's phone and say, all right, is the data in there or not? Is has this person connected the phone to a laptop and stolen some data? Is you know transferred it from the USB into the system or not? Has this person transferred it and then deleted it so that he can recover it again later or not? So again, you know, these factors all need to be looked at. And these are certain things like, you know, you have to have tools like that to get it. Uh, again, uh, another video, which I think I'm going to have to uh, leave. And then, you know, you can also get data of chip off devices. There are cases where one has to, you know, take the chips off the motherboard of a phone and then get it maybe to bypass encryption. Maybe to, uh, you know, uh, because uh, it's not accessible any other way. So when you do that, you need specialized hardware. You need to plug it in and with the right interfaces and the software, you can get it out. Uh, again, this is extremely interesting because decoding the data, which is in X and trying to figure out what it means takes a while and it can be very interesting. Some can be automated. A lot of it may not be automated. You get a lot of hidden nuggets and gems inside. Uh, which, you know, are fascinating and give you great insights. Because today, you know, phones are uh, are a window into a user's soul. <laughs> I, I, I always say that, you know, a, a criminal will always lie, his phone will always tell the truth. And, uh, you know, in fact, people quote me on this. So what happens is that uh, when you look at a person's phone, you can get a deep insight into the person's uh, 
thought process into the person's methodology into the way the person operates and this kind of stuff so there are all sorts of like uh, end cases there uh, for this is the gold standard when it comes to disk and uh, mobile phone investigations this has got two of them in case mobile investigator and in case forensic it's a very old tool uh, in fact 93 of the top 100 uh, fortune 100 companies use this tool it's pretty useful there and this is the only tool that can help you get into black boxes suppose you've given a very interesting thing like you know you have a crash plane and you have to investigate the black box which is orange by the way uh, and you need to you know get the data out this is the only tool that will do it and this helps you investigate and analyze data from multiple uh, platforms uh, sun solaris for example we found you know that uh, the airport authority has solaris systems and if you wanted to actually look at a thing like that and you will not be able to use any other of the simple point and click tools to do it because this has the versatility and the ability to get into all sorts of different oss which this does not others don't have so pretty useful again uh, easy to use then there's this is another very fast tool i love the point and click interface of this which makes it very easy to get into uh, the cloud forensics memory and stuff like that and get the data and uh, this is the flow uh, very good for incident response uh, you acquire examine review analyze and report then this is for social media you get out there collect the data on the web you have something happening against your organization or if something's trending on the web which is sort of you know defaming your organization this is the tool to do it get out there you can check you know 10 11 different uh, sources of social media get content related to you and get moving so uh manage collections this is for gps devices i do I'm not sure how much relevance this may have in a corporate kind of an environment but uh, definitely today you know uh, vehicles have gps's and vehicles contain a lot of information and especially the high end vehicles you know you have navstar you have uh, user assist you have all sorts of things and it will give you a lot of information including where you stopped where you went and you know uh, how long were you there and that kind of information is extremely useful plus what were you playing maybe your phone was ringing at the time you were driving at the time of the accident and things like that a lot of insurance companies are beginning to you know utilize this kind of technology to try and figure out whether to pay the insurance claim or not things like that then there is of course i mentioned that uh, deleted and hidden video kind of a thing uh, you can get that video announcement or oh, this is a lovely example uh, you know uh, of getting the number plates which are at angles at you know measuring heights in fact uh, this particular case of the rayan school in bonsi where a child was murdered was solved by just measuring the height of a person who was not visible so that is there so uh, things like that uh, these are some examples of that and uh, this is authentication you can identify tampered uh, areas of a uh, image you can identify you know if there's been some uh, fakery going on and things like that face matching is beginning to you know become an area of great concern and this is you can see that happening here uh, you can actually identify people based on their faces but today not just faces in case of disasters there are partial faces there are uh, things like tattoos and uh, you can identify people on the basis of tattoos and things like that so that's it uh, that brings me to the end i'm sorry i rushed through all this and i'm sorry i took up some additional time uh, but i hope you found it useful i am available i am accessible uh, my ppt is also available so that's me please do stay in touch if you have any questions i'm available thank you oh wow wonderful amazing like you know everyone i was just glued to the screen and this is this is so much of information so much of tools uh, people are asking for you know uh, they need whole day session and they want you to continue but uh, yes uh, um, so okay maybe uh, I, i don't need to say anything samir just see how the chats are following in <laughs> thank thank you everyone thank you so much wonderful uh, concluding uh, 